So you ready to get started? Hi everybody, I'm thinking we'll get started. Um, we have a few people wandering in, but I think we'll try to get started and stay close to schedule. I think you can hear me. I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute. A big welcome. I see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, this is a great and amazing time for China Institute. Thank you for putting up with us. What you see here is phase one of a three-phase construction that we're um, going. I'm delighted to announce that we um, raised enough money to build out a new space downstairs and upstairs behind you on the space. So hopefully when you come back to visit us in the near future, you'll be able to come to our main entrance on Washington Street, climb up and have access so that we can offer more people direct access to our gallery, to programs like this. Um, and we couldn't do it without the support of the city and state of New York through matching grants from the T.H. Tong Foundation and from trustees of China Institute. And I just wanted to take a moment to do a shout out to our newest trustee, Mr. Peter Walker, who's here just joined us. And <laughs> master spending an illustrious career at McKinsey. And our longest serving, don't worry, I was not gonna say oldest, our longest serving <laughs> trustee, Yvonne Wong, is here. Ingrid Ehrenberg, who serves on our executive committee. Thank you. So we're in for a big treat tonight. Um, Bill, who's standing right here, you didn't come to listen to me, so I promise I'll keep it short. Um, Din has written a true eccentric. I don't know if that's really fair or not, but it's in the best sense of the word. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> He's an expert on Buddhism as well as Chinese philosophy. He's lived in a Buddhist monastery, traveled through China's remote mountains, and convened with modern-day Taoist and Buddhist hermits. I'm very eager. I'm not sure what a hermit means, but we're about to find out. He's also a prolific writer and a translator of ancient classical Chinese philosophy and poetry. And I should say that yesterday, as to his accolades, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, what happened? He received Thornton Wander Prize for translation, which is really coveted. <laughs> We're really delighted. I, I as first went to China in the 1960s, and it was a very, very different place. But I, I imagine that <coughs> the world that Bill sort of first discovered in the 1980s and 90s um, may have changed less, actually, over time than the China that I've seen. Um, but the hermit tradition has survived decades of political turmoil. And I think you return what, almost every year to speak with monks and speak with hermits on almost regular, daily basis. And just got back a trip, from a trip to a Zen monastery in Jiangxi. So, as I said, you didn't come to listen to me, you came to listen to Bill, you know, so I'll hand it over to him. And later in the program, our head of programming, um, Din Elliott, will be back to lead a Q&A. So, over to you, Bill. Thank you, James, and then the Institute for inviting me here. Um, it's just really weird to be here. Um, was it 40? 48 years ago, just up the road there, at the other end of Broadway, I, I, I was getting a degree in anthropology from Santa Barbara, and I wanted to study with Margaret Mead with Benedict at, at, at Columbia. I applied to, for all the fellowships you could apply for. I was getting the GI Bill from the Army, that, uh, from the service end, of uh, $100 a month, and I needed more money than that. So I checked all the fellowships you could apply for, and they had this language fellowship funded by the Defense Department. And you had to, if you were willing to study a rare language, you could apply. You just had to write in the language. And I just read a book about Zen called The Way of Zen, uh, of Zen by Alan Watts. And, <coughs> and I thought, wow, that makes so much sense. And it had some Chinese characters. And so just on a whim, I wrote in the word Chinese. And so that's why I'm here today. <laughs> I had no interest in China or Chinese. <laughs> And I was so embarrassed when they gave me this fellowship. <laughs> I felt like a fraud. I, I, and when I started studying Chinese, it was a terrible, terrible experience. <laughs> I, I went, the fellowship required me to do a study intensive Chinese. And the woman who taught the intensive Chinese at Columbia was extremely famous. She's, her name was Loretta Pond, and everybody, nobody calls her Loretta Pond. She's always, she's always been called the Dragon Lady. 
<laughs> we started the class with 24, it's uh, four hours a day, five days a week. And we started with 24 students, and after two weeks we were down to four. <laughs> and she asked me to stay after, I stayed after. She said, Mr. Porter, I only teach the best, and you're not one of them. So <laughs> I want you to drop this class. <laughs> And I, I said, I can't drop it. It's my fellowship requires me to take it. She said, well, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And she didn't. I, I, I became a ghost in the class. I took the class and I didn't exist. Finally, I had to get the department chairman, Hans Bielenstein, to convince her to include me. But she got even by giving me a D for the class, which canceled my fellowship. But, but when you go to the universities, at least they have this provision that you can challenge a class. And so I had to re-challenge the class. I got a, a B plus in it. But she gave me a D. That was my experience with Chinese. <laughs> and so it was a terrible experience. Um, and if it wasn't for the money, I would have dropped it a long time ago. But while I was in New York City, I started uh, uh, one of my uh, classmates said that there was a, he met a Chinese monk down in Chinatown, and I, I uh, came to meet him, and, and he was a really nice guy. I couldn't speak any English, and my Chinese was, of course, you know, very limited. So we, I just met him, and I was so impressed by his aura, by the kind of person he was. I started spending the weekends with him up the Hudson, uh, meditating at a little retreat he had. Uh, a light doing that so much, after two years I decided getting a PhD was not so interesting and wasn't really what I was really after. I was interested in him and that kind of life. And so I, I, I quit the PhD program in Columbia and went to live in a monastery in Taiwan. It was, my choice was Taiwan in 1972 because the Cultural Revolution was going on in China. And so that's where I, I became in really conversed, you might say, in Buddhist practice. And, they were so welcoming in Taiwan. Uh, 1972, very few Westerners were, were living there, but they accepted me with open arms. And I, I spent about three years in these two different monasteries, and finally the, the abbot said, you know, you've been here three years now or so. It's, it, you should be a monk. Uh, and uh, I left shortly after that. Because I, I have a problem with authority. I really like Buddhism, but I hate people telling me what to do. So I, I ended up living in a farming village. 14 years in Taiwan. But before I left, he, the, the abbot, uh, handed me a book he had self-published. Self it was the poetry of Cold Mountain, or Han Shan, 300 poems in Chinese by this hermit named Han Shan, to whom Jack Kerouac had dedicated Dharma bombs. And, and he had taken uh, the, the liberty to pirate Burton Watson's English translations and stick them at the back. <laughs> Burton had translated one third of the poems. So I could see the Chinese poems, and then I could see the English translations by a really good translator. And so I started translating, because <coughs> um, Cobalt was famous for being really one of the first vernacular poets in, in the Chinese language, lived around the year 800. But his poetry is so accessible. Like a lot of classical Chinese, really difficult. It's an official writing a poem for another official. Cold Mountain was trying to talk to people. So I, I, I started translating these, these, these poems. And after I left the monastery in this farming village, I, I kept translating them. And one day in Taiwan, I met an American who said, hey, I know a publisher in America. And, and he, sent, he sent the poems to this publisher where I live now, in Port Townsend, Washington, near Seattle. And, and they published them. I was so surprised. I had no interest in publishing anything. But they published them. And, and then the, the Chinese text I was using, the Qing Dynasty Woodblock Edition, after Cold Mountain, there was this other poet named Stonehouse. And I started reading his poems, and they were even better. And so I translated his poem, poems and then published them. And, um, and then I got married. Um, and so I had to get a job. And so I started working at a radio station in Taiwan. It was the old English, the American military station that they had to give up when we recognized China. Uh, and uh, a nonprofit took it over and ran it as an English language station. And they, they managed to get some funding from the Asia Foundation to hire someone to do local news. And one of the guys uh, uh, who worked there met, had met me and said, oh, I know this guy who knows some Chinese. And 
I didn't even know anybody. I, don't, I I'd never read a Chinese newspaper in my life. But they, they hired me to do local news. And I'd come in every morning at 5 o'clock, read all the local news papers and include local news, and I'd interview people. And uh, after a couple of, about five or six years of doing this, I, I wondered, do people like Cold Mountain and Stonehouse, do they really exist? And I, I applied to the Guggenheim Foundation to, to go to my hermits in China. And so I was interviewing this one man whose name was Winston Wong. He was the son of the richest man in Taiwan. He, you know, he, he owned a, a Formosa Plastics. Um, Wang Yongqing's son, Wang, Wang Wenyang. So I was interviewing Winston, and I, I happened to ask him, have you ever seen the movie The Graduate? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had two PhDs from different universities in England, in chemistry and in, in chem, uh, chemical engineering and optical engineering. And, and so he, he was educated. He said, yeah, I said, I've seen a graduate. And um, I said, so what would you tell a modern graduate? And he said, I would tell them to follow the Tao. And he didn't mean the Dow Jones. <laughs> <laughs> he meant the Dow. So I was so impressed with that answer, I, I confided in him, well, you know, this is probably my, my last interview, because I've applied to the Guggenheim Foundation to go to China to find hermits. And he said, that's a great idea. Well, if they don't give you the money, I will. Oh. So, you know, a couple weeks later, I got turned down by the Guggenheim Foundation. <laughs> I called him up, and he said, how much you want? <laughs> um, and so I, I said, maybe about 5,000 ought to be about right. And so he funded my, my trip to go to China to find a place. And so that's why I, I, I became, and I didn't know where to find hermits. Where are you going to find your hermits? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, they're hermits. <laughs> and, and then second of all, it's China. Um, and so I just happened to be on Beijing, go to start with Beijing. And uh, it was it was the week when all this, when the, the Tiananmen was full of students. It was, it was the last week, it was after the first week of May of 89. Uh, but I happened to go to this Buddhist temple. I met this monk who was the, the deputy director of the Buddhist Association of China, Master Jinghui, Jinghui Fashu. And he said, you know, I think I've heard of some hermits still living in the Jungnan Mountains. I didn't even know where the Jungnan Mountains were. But I asked some people, and he said, well, there's some south of Xi'an. In fact, I didn't even know because in China, you don't, there's no word, there's no uh, thing you put on the end of a word for a plural. I thought the Jonan Mountains was a Jonan Mountain. It, it turns out they're about 800 kilometers long from east to west, and about 200 kilometers uh, north to south. So um, I just hired a taxi, and I had a photographer friend I invited who could join me for this trip. I went into the mountains and uh, told a taxi driver to drop me off at the foot of the mountains and come back in two days. <laughs> well, because, in, you know, in, in, at that time in China, the, the Westerners especially could not go into the mountains. That was you know, illegal. Um, so I figured as long as nobody saw me, I was okay. So and once you're in the mountains, who are you going to meet, right? Uh, so I, I walked into the mountains with my friend, and about two hours later, we're sitting in a little hut writing down hermit addresses. Uh, we met hermits everywhere in the Jungnan Mountains. And so I'm going to show you some slides based upon uh, some from that first trip in 1989 and then again in 90. And that's when I decided to write a book about this called Road to Heaven. It's not a great title, but it's just what came to mind. It's what, no one has ever written a book about Chinese hermits up to, this, up to 1989. No Chinese person had ever written a book about Chinese hermits. So I didn't know what to do with it. I thought this was an important tradition. Because I didn't realize how important it was. It's, it's so different from our hermit tradition. We have hermits, but they're misanthropes. They want to live away from society. They want nothing to do with society. But Chinese hermits are, are and always have been an important part of society. As far back as Chinese records go, we have stories about hermits. And among those stories are emperors seeking out hermits, asking them to come serve in their government, or even trying to turn over their throne to these hermits. Hermits are important people. Um, it's, I tell people it's, it's, uh, it is like in the West what we call uh, uh, 
PhD program for someone following a spiritual path. Instead of studying chemistry, you study your spirit. And if you're going to do that in China, you go into the mountains um, and you do that. It's like getting a PhD, the typical government spends about three to five years. Um, and I'd say 99.9% .9 of all mountains have no hermits. There are certain graduate institutes in China, in the mountains. Certain mountains have been identified over thousands of years as a good place to practice. And so these people go to that mountain. It just turns out the mountain south of Xi'an has always been a great place to practice because it's, it was the south uh, of, the, of the capitals uh, since 1000 BC. So this has always been where, where people would go to practice um, as, as this tradition, whereby they go into the mountains three to five years, and then they go down the mountains. They become the teachers. And um, I was telling Dinda earlier today that I don't think that, I've never heard of any master in China who was not a hermit. And I'm talking about historical records as, as well as modern times whether you're Taoist or Buddhist or Confucian, anybody who's a significant enough teacher has spent time alone, has gotten their PhD. And of course, this is a degree that is self-awarded. You might spend three, five years, you might spend 10 or 20. Um, I've, met, I've met a number of hermits who would hate to come down. They don't go come down, so people go up to see them. So that's sort of my, my general introduction to this, this tradition. But I thought the best way to do it is to show you some slides. And then we can talk about it some more afterwards. So I always like to begin with this slide. Um, let me see. Because it, it's important to know where China came. It's important to know how China came about physically. And of course, these aren't the, 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 the outline of, of the ancient landforms on the, on the planet, but just when this event happened 150 million years ago, or 50 million years ago, and, and the Indian plate raised the center, that Eurasian plate, it, 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 it did two things. It forced all the water to go either east or west. And it also cut off the annual monsoons. And this is the most important uh, aspect of this for, for China. Because you see, the water not only goes from west to east. There's no there's no rainfall. Does this thing have a, have a little thing? There's no rainfall in Central Asia, and so uh, when it rains, it, all the all the soil gets washed into the, this river. Uh, both the, the Yellow River in the north, the, the Yangtze in the middle, and then the uh, West River in the south. Um, in this next slide, well, this, is the, this is China today, but when China became a civilization, this is how it looked in the north. You can see that in Neolithic times, in 5500 BC, none of what we call the heartland of China existed. It was all in the ocean. All of it. All the way from Beijing in the north, all the way to where the Yellow River Haiphong, um, all of it in the ocean. Uh, what, what this Yellow River is, is it's what, what created China. It's uh, the, the second muddiest river in the world is the Colorado, and it carries up to 10% <coughs> silt during the summer. The Yellow River during the summer carries 50% silt, five times more silt. The Yellow River is just a mud fire hose. <coughs> That just, that's just uh, about, about a million years ago, there's a mountain range right here called the Taihung Mountains. Taihung Mountains. And a million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, the Yellow River broke through those mountains and then started swinging back and forth, back and forth, filling the ocean with mud. And so what this did, it created this huge, huge uh, floodplain. There were no rocks and there were no trees. Chinese civilization uh, developed along the Yangtze in little isolated spots, but never in, in a massive area because how can you cut down the trees? But there were no trees in the, on the floodplain and no rocks. So you could farm with a stick. You could dig a, uh, if you had dig, stick technology, you could dig a, a ditch and you could do irrigation and so forth. So this is where Chinese 
civilization developed and why it developed here along the Yellow. <coughs> because mud, mud, and it came down every year and kept flooding and flooding and flooding. And so this filled in over over time. The, this huge floodplain, which was the breadbasket of, of, of Chinese civilization. And right about where that arrow is, all the early cities, to the extent that there were cities, had to be uh, on the highlands, either the, the Taihang Mountains were too steep. So usually the early cities were, were along this stretch right there. And where that red arrow is, is the grave of China's Adam. All Chinese, in fact, almost all East Asians and South Asians are, defend, are descendants from a man and a woman. Just like in the West, Westerners are descended from Adam and Eve. Well, Chinese, and again, all the hill tribes and everybody else, are descended from Fu Xi and Yuan. This is the grave of Fu Xi. It lived around, some people say around 3500 BC, tends to be a, a, rough, a rough guess. And of course, he's the one who invented the trigrams, that, uh, uh, of which the you know are formed the basis of the I Ching. This is around 3500 BC. People come here um, to pay their respects, usually around the third lunar month. And this is the, the town he created. It was called Huayang, Huayang, on the on the, the sunny side of the Huai River. Um, nowadays, the Chinese have sort of lost this this. Uh, connection with their past in, in a lot of different areas. One of those areas is the respect for their ancestors, which is odd, considering the Chinese respect their ancestors more than anybody. But they really lost the, 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 the connection with, say, Pusi and Iwa. And you almost never see these places with, like this. This is a little shrine for Pusi and Iwa. And you'll notice that they have horns coming out of their head. That's because um, the, the Chinese, uh, Pusi and Yuwa, are half dragon and half human. And the, the bottom half is serpentine, and the, the uh, upper torso is human. And of course, like dragons, they've got little horns. And so this is, again, about food. Does this thing work? And it doesn't work on screens. It doesn't work on screens, OK. Anyway, uh, Pusi and Yuwa. Um, a few hundred years later, the next man made Huayang his capital as well, was Shannong, the man who uh, is responsible for identifying which plants could be grown for cereals, grains, and which plants had medicinal value. And the place he did this where he found all these plants is named after him today. It's down along the Yangtze River uh, in this mountain range called the Shannongjia, the Shannongjia Range. Uh, that the three gorges go, go through. I took this photo from a boat going through the, the, the three gorges. And so this is where Shennong came to gather plants and then the agriculture, and he lived around 2800 BC. And then after him you get these other semi-historical figures, Emperor Yao, Emperor Shun, uh, Yu, Yu the Great. Um, and again, you, you, you can travel to China all you want and just you'll almost never see figures like this. Nobody honors Fu Xi or Niwa or Shandong or Yao, Shun, Yu the Great. Um, if they had any tourist potential, people would. <laughs> but but any, anyway, I, I'm, I'm traveling right now 89.90 when none of this is, 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 is being exploited yet. Um, and so following those three figures, then you, you enter the historical period in China. And of course, it's all along the Yellow River. These were the first great dynasties begin, all the different highlands um, uh, along, along the Yellow River. And of course, we finally get documents in the Zhou Dynasty and to some extent in the Shang Dynasty. We don't have any actual documents from the Xia Dynasty, but, but we have, have remains. Um, anyway, this is early China, and it's all along here. And in the Zhou Dynasty, where that where Huayang used to be, there's uh, Huayang again is, is down here right to the left of that arrow is a little town called Liuyi, and this is where where I want to begin the the story of China's hermit tradition. Because in this little town, we get China's first significant Taoist. His name is Lao Tzu. This is his home, 
these village women have come to pay their respects to Lao and just uh, outside of the village is his old observatory. Um, there's a couple of, there's a Taoist priest there. One of those uh, on the left is a Taoist priest. Um, there's a Taoist also up there. Because if you're going to study the Tao, you have to study the movements of forces that are really hard to see, the forces inside your body. Sometimes it's really hard to see what's going on in your body, as you can imagine. But the body is, according to Taoists, it's just a microcosm of the, uh, of the greater cosmos. So sometimes it's easier to see what's going on inside by seeing what's going on outside. And so these early Taoists would build observatories and look at cloud formations. Naturally, the stars, comets, anything they could see, but especially clouds, the color of clouds, uh, very significant about what's going on in, inside your, your body. So this is, this is the, the site of Lao Tzu. This is about 500 BC that he lived here. Of course, this is not the original one. It's been rebuilt a, a number of times. But this is where, where he lived. And eventually, he moved uh, west and, and went from Huayang down here, and went to the capital in Luoyang, became the royal record keeper. Luoyang became a, one of the great capitals of ancient China. And um, eventually, he got tired of, of uh, civilization and left Luoyang and came to this pass called the Handuguan Pass. Uh, in ancient China, it was said, whoever holds the Handuguan Pass controls China. Uh, even during the Second World War, the Japanese were unable to break through this pass. They had to fly over it. Uh, it's like that, that pass, was it Thermopylae in Greece? One of those passes. The hot gates, right? Uh, anyway, the Handuguan Pass. So Lao Tzu was met here by the keeper of the pass, who recognized him as a sage. And so this is uh, where, where, right here is the Hanuman Pass. And then this, this Taoist master took Lao Tzu to Huashan, which is a Taoist mountain. Uh, there's some pictures uh, in, in the exhibition of Huashan, means flower mountain. It's, it's a significant mountain in China because uh, the Han Chinese identify themselves with this mountain. This is where the Han Chinese ethnic uh, group uh, began around Hua Shan. In fact, that's why they use the name Hua. In Zhonghua, China, that Hua is the name of this mountain. And so Lao Tzu came here. Um, you can't quite see the mountain in this, in this slide. There's a, 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 what do you call it, a, a spine coming up, coming along here. Um, I don't suppose there's a way of turning the lights, is there? No. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. We'll just go so this is the near the uh, this is a typical place where Taoists live. You see there's a girl on a cliff. She's standing on, on two two by fours and holding onto an iron chain, and it's three thousand feet straight down. She's got a purse, she's got loafers on. <laughs> and she's going to find this hermit. Because these are the kind of places Taoist hermits seek out. Taoist hermits, oh, that's wonderful. Taoist uh, hermits really want more seclusion than Buddhists. They go to a lot more trouble than Buddhists. Um, because their practice involves much more prolonged and intricate meditations. I, I, I know it's, it's a simplification, but Taoist meditation is like that woman at, at the circus who starts spinning the plates and has to get all 30 of the plates spinning. And that takes a while. And they don't really want anybody knocking on their door. <laughs> and all the plates you know, come crashing down. Because, because, because they're opening up energy channels all throughout their body and, and, and making this, this transformation. Whereas a Buddhist term, it tends just to be chanting the name of the Buddha, asking themselves, who is chanting the name of the Buddha? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they can put the name of the Buddha down any time. In fact, they're probably glad to put it down. But that was term, it's not so much. So they seek out places like this. But when I took this, uh, this photo, I, I'd already asked a, a Taoist, is anybody there? And he said, no. He <laughs> had moved down. The hermit had moved down. Uh, down the mountain. Uh, as the, the hermit had lived there for 50 years and developed rheumatism. 
Anyway, these are the typical places that she was looking for, or a Taoist is, is looking for. Uh, that, that cave down at the bottom there, uh, the, the cave it lived in by a very famous woman of the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago, the Jade Maiden of the Bright Star. And there's a really nice, fancy cave up there that's overgrown, and it has a skylight. <laughs> uh, and with post holes, and that would, would have had eaves to keep out the rain and the wind. So these Taoists really like to uh, seek out these very remote places for their practice. Anyway, I'll try to give you those examples. Uh, this is the hermit that woman was looking for. He had moved down the mountain. He was 85 when I, I took this photo. And he, his, he says his, his rheumatism was just too bad because it was, it was cold on the top of the mountain. But anyway, this is a where Lao Tzu also stopped on his way, and he continued on past Sion uh, to this other uh, set of mountains called the Jungnan Mountains. In the back, there's the Jungnan Mountains in the background, and this is that low soil that blows down from Mongolia and cannot get past the mountains, so it settles there. It's some of the deepest soil in the whole world. And in this escarpment that I took a photo of, that, uh, of there's a, a human a jaw and, and uh, Part of the skull were found that were dated 1.3 million years. So people have been, humans have been living here a long time. Um, and this is pretty much the area, the reason the soil is so deep is because remember, the Yellow River couldn't get down past the mountains until a million years ago. And so all the silt was accumulating in this inland area. It would have been a huge lake in those days. But anyway, this is an artist's rendition of the Jonan Mountains. And that little knoll sitting out on the front is where Lao Tzu came and finally wrote down the Tao Te Ching. It became uh, one of the basic and most famous texts of, of Taoism. Um, this is the earliest known complete copy we have of the Tao Te Ching. It's dated around 200 BC, which is when the, the tombs that it was found in were, were closed. So it was, maybe it was written around 250 BC. We've also found partial copies of the Tao Te Ching dated around uh, 300 to 350 BC. Um, again, he wrote it around 500 BC. So this, this was, and again, the, the text hasn't changed. Hardly, occasionally a character will be slightly different in different versions. But this is where Taoism begins. Again, in, in the mountains, always associated with mountains. If Lao Tzu's a grave, probably not his real grave. The Chinese like to have ceremonial graves, a grave where they can conduct a ceremony. Um, so these Taoists all live down here in this area. Uh, Zhuangzi, Zhuangzi's hometown is in South Xian. Um, and up here all the Confucians live. Chifu uh, was where <coughs> Confucius lived. And in uh, Zhou Xian is where Monk Mencius lived. And this little dot right down here is where is Sunzi's grave, the man who made Confucius in the state religion. Um, this is where Confucius was born and abandoned. His mother, the pregnancy was apparently a little bit longer than normal, maybe like 10 months, and he was born with a rather large forehead, and his mother thought he was a monster and abandoned him in this cave. And uh, it just happened that the tiger, tigress had given birth to cubs and suckled him. And a eagle stood watch over the cave, keeping him away. And his mother realized, this is a special guy. And she took him back. <laughs> It's there today, um, Confucius. And of course, he's, Confucius is the great teacher. He's the first prominent person we know of who would teach anybody who showed up. <coughs> and to that time, people who were teachers would teach the, the sons of the wealthy, uh, the nobles. But uh, Confucius changed that. And that's why his birthday every year, the 28th of September, is called Teacher's Day. Um, and uh, anyway, he became the fountainhead for what later became known as Confucianism. But he too, uh, and this is, his old home has been made into a big, huge shrine hall. And behind that, there's another shrine hall. Behind that, there's another shrine hall. And behind that, there's another shrine hall. <laughs> um, different emperors would, would pay to have these things built. This is his grave. That it says, uh, the grave of the exalted sage. Xuanzheng. Uh, in Chufu, the town of Chufu. And if you just go a little bit north of Chifu, you come to China's most sacred mountain, Taishan. The reason it's 
it's uh, sacred is because this is where your spirit goes for reassignment to the next life. So people try to make a pilgrimage to this mountain sometime in their life to pay their respects uh, and basically to ask, ask for intercession for their departed loved ones. And so these two buildings actually are 1,000 years old. The roofs are a thousand years old, and they, they're covered with murals depicting an emperor's uh, <coughs> visit to this monastery. Because in ancient times, you couldn't become an emperor unless you had come to Taishan and paid your respects. It's that, that important of a place. And of course, this is where Confucius used to come. In fact, on the archway in Chinese, it says, uh, Confucius climbed here. <laughs> Quite literally. And it says the number one mountain on, on the left side. So Confucius used to come here too, and these are shrines, little, little places where uh, p different people have paid little, uh, to build a little shrine where you can burn paper money, because you know you can burn money and and it is transferred to you know these places have little have the wire code, so they can they can send the money on to the next life to the account of your loved ones, and, and different emperors have paid to have these. This old mud trail, it would have been a mud trail, made it to this great stone pathway now. And you can see this going all the way up to the top. And you can see there's a man right there at, on the left there. He's got about 30 bottles of beer on his shoulders. <laughs> so you, you don't get thirsty unless you're, unless you're broke. Um, anyway, it takes about five hours to climb up the whole mountain if you're in reasonable health. But they have cable cars now, too. So this is Taishan. This is the summit of Taishan. There's a Taoist priest about to go into that shrine hall. He has his blue robes on, and he's going to conduct a ceremony to the goddess of the mountain, Bixia Yuanjun, uh, the jade maiden of, the, of, the, of azure colored clouds. And so those are the first two traditions that, briefly, the Taoists, the Buddhists, and the, and the, and the Confucians all built their places uh, in mountains or associated with mountains. As Confucianism developed into the state religion, you, you get the appearance of what's called the Confucian Academies in different parts of China. And there, every one of them is, is in a mountain. And usually what they would do, they would build the academy as a, as a set of classrooms, um, sometimes at the foot of the mountain, sometimes halfway up. And then the people who would come there would build huts. They would circle the mountain in huts, and you would spend your time in your hut, and then you would come to classes during the day. So Confucianism and Taoism is all based on the, this experience of solitude uh, is, is important in your life. And of course, around the time of Christ, you know, Buddhism shows up, coming across this, uh, what is now Xinjiang province, through uh, Taxila, uh, Islamabad, and Afghanistan, Pakistan, and up uh, across either the northern or the southern route around the Taklamakan Desert, to the world's second largest desert, uh, and then through these different oases into these cap capitals of, of either Chang'an, Baixian, or Luoyang. Uh, when, when Buddhism showed up, Luoyang was the capital. And this was the first monastery, White Horse Temple, because the monks showed up with, uh, with their scriptures being carried by white horses. And there's the grave of the first monk who, he died around 76 AD, I believe, as Matanga. But right after Matanga and his friend, uh, another monk, Tamaraksha, came, they, they left Luoyang and went up to northern China and created the first Buddhist retreat center, which is still a Buddhist retreat center called uh, Wu Tai Shan. So as soon as Buddhism shows up in China, it also heads for the mountains. This is Wu Tai Shan today. There's probably 30 monasteries and nunneries. There are uh, thousands of monks and nuns who live there today. A lot of Tibetans come here because the, the center became famous for its Vajrayana practice. Um, but, and also as Buddhism spread throughout China, other centers uh, developed, especially that one called Zhou Huashan over there along the Yangtze. This is a picture of Zhou Huashan, means nine flower mountain because you know there's nine major peaks. There's the old pilgrim trail. Now there's a road that goes up to the top. But you can take the pilgrim trail and then at some point it's, it, there's stones, and people can walk up the Pilgrim uh, Trail, and you can see there's all these locks. Because when people go to, a, when people in China make a pilgrimage, it's to earn merit that they can then transfer to someone else. 
usually if their 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 parents are ill, or uh, or maybe they want something good to happen. They want to pass the college entrance exam, <laughs> and so they'll make this hike and they'll put a lock on this chain and they'll, they'll and they'll make a vow. The typical basic your basic merit vow is I will be a vegetarian twice a month. <laughs> And so in China, on new moon and full moon nights, restaurants are packed with people ordering vegetarian meals so they can keep this vow. And so they say, this, this lock will rust away before I break my vow. And of course, they earn merit and that they then transfer to their, their loved ones or the order to themselves in the case of college entrance exams. But you can see, that again, there's a hermit, I mean, there's a, a big pilgrimage center up on the mountain. And, and there's... Every mountain is sacred because of a reason. A, a Korean monk came here in the Tang Dynasty and was recognized as the incarnation of a bodhisattva, a bodhisattva named Siddhagarbha, who has vowed to rescue everybody in hell, ex except Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and his body is still kept inside an urn there and taken out privately every year and given a sponge bath. <laughs> but so this is what... Uh, so, uh, there's some event takes place and a mountain is recognized as a sacred mountain and a good place to practice. And um, so even though this is the back side of the mountain, you can see how remote it is. Look, and, and uh, there's nobody living there, it would appear, but that's not true. There's a hut right over there, and this is, the woman's living there. She lived there about 30 years before she died. Everybody called her the tiger lady because Every time I visited her, there would be tiger footprints around her hut or in her garden. The, the South China tiger uh, is about the size of a German shepherd. And it's very rare now in China. And I don't think there are any more around her hut. Um, she's gone. There's a picture of her coming out of, out of her hut there. Um, but the place I want to introduce you today uh, isn't, isn't Wu Taishan or Zhou Huashan. It's these mountains south of Xi'an called the Jungnan Mountains, uh, right down, in, down there. And this is the, 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 the city wall in Xi'an. Xi'an is a, a relatively new town. This wall is only 600 years old. It, it, it circles the entire city. They, they hold a, a marathon on it every, every year. But if you, uh, if one day, I, if I flew out of Xi'an one day on a clear day. These are the Jungnan Mountains from the air flying out of Xi'an. And this is also a picture of at least uh, 60, 70 hermits mm -hmm. in, along this one watershed, the Fung River. Um, when I did my interviews of hermits, there were about 200 hermits living in the, the section of the Jungnan Mountains south of Xi'an. Um, uh, five years ago, a, a movie studio asked me to, wanted to film me going into the same mountains, re-interviewing hermits in the same area, and the head of the film crew had, had read my book and had made it his mission to meet all the hermits in the mountains. And between 89 and, uh, and what was it, 2012, uh, more hermits had moved up the mountains. And instead of 200 hermits living in the, the mountains, there were 600. And um, these, these are the, the, the mountains from the ground level. There was only one road going through the mountains. And, and the, the, in those days, so I would hire a taxi. That was my modus operandi because I'm always, you're always operating illegally when you do things like this in China. Um, but I just tell the driver, take me to the end of the road, and then the road would end at some village. And uh, hermits, well, farmers are just like us. They will commute to work, but not much more than an hour. So hermits have to live beyond the farmer commute. Like, so they have to live about two hours walk from the, from the nearest village. So that's what you do in China if you're looking for hermits. You go to a mountain area known for hermits, go to the last village, and walk. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what trail, just walk. And uh, it's China, so you'll meet people on the trail. And these are, are farmers who are collecting walnuts and they're collecting the walnuts planted by hermits. Because oh. hermits have been living there a long time. Her and hermits need money. So they've got to exchange something to get by. So when you're w walking in China and you want to meet some hermits and you just meet somebody on the mountain, you just ask them. Uh, you, 
you know, in this mountain. You may all shoot down the red. Is anybody cultivating the Tao on this mountain? And they know exactly what you're talking about. And they'll either take you to meet the hermits or they'll do you a, draw a little map on the, in the, in the dirt and off you go. And then there's a hermit now. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how wide the trail is. There is no trail, really. It's just the grass is bent down a little bit in places. <clears throat> Um, and he was only coming down because he was out of food. And he was going to ask the villagers for some help. So hermits get some help from villagers. Maybe about 20% of what they need they get from local villagers. And so he was point, telling me he'd be back in a couple hours and pointing to his hut and uh, inviting me to, to spend the night in this hut. Uh, and he had lived there for 10 years, which is uh, relatively long. For a, a hermit, again, it's like a, the Germans have the a big student, the, the students who go to graduate school and never leave. And, and you do get hermits who go to graduate school, go to the mountains, and they like it so much, believe it or not, uh, because they'll go down the mountain and they'll say, oh, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to be poured in the mountains than poured in town. And so uh, that's his hut, the, the, the windy, uh, cold, but it works. Um, and on the back side of that mountain, this is the most famous hut in China. This is the hut where Empty Cloud lived. Xu Lao, Xu Yun. Xu Yun, the greatest Zen master of modern times, died at the age of 120 in the 50s. Um, found and found, re reestablished Zen practice in China. In a sense, almost single handedly. And this is the hut where he got the name Empty Cloud because he came here in this uh, two, 1903. He spent three years meditating here. There's stories about how he would meditate and he would he would come out of the meditation and he'd put some potatoes on to cook. <laughs> and they were all rotten, covered with mildew. He would spend he was sort of like a Taoist meditator. He would do really long meditations. So this is a typical hut. You you go to the mounds and these huts are left vacant. You know, you, you spend your time in them. But people have been doing this without a thousand or two thousand years on this mountain. So you have to do a little work maybe sometimes. But in Hermit Realty, this is a fixer-upper. It's, <laughs> it's going to need a lot of work. But you can see, it, you can't really see, but there's a stream. The two things you need is you need water and you need firewood. So just like a wild animal, you have to have a territory, a firewood territory. Because no hermit cuts, cuts wood. You, you only pick up deadfall, what is blown down, what is, what is uh, on the ground. And, not, and of course, they're all vegetarians, too. They don't kill animals. So you need, you need an area. I've estimated that the area is about 15 minutes. That's the hermit buffer between huts. You need a 15-minute radius so, for you to have enough territory to gather uh, firewood. And also plants. Not just uh, the plants you plant, but wild plants. Um, some for medicinal uses, some to sell uh, to herb collectors uh, that come up the mountain looking for these, these plants. Uh, this is a, a brand new hut. Um, and you can see it, it, th that low soil in this part of China has such great cohesive qualities, you can build these bricks wet. You, you make the brick in the form, and you don't have to wait for it to dry. You just put another form on top of it and build that, that, that the, the mud and the straw together, <coughs> another brick, another brick, another brick, another brick. It took them a couple, uh, six days to build this hut, these farmers. And the farmers built this hut because this, this, the monk didn't know how to do it. He, he was a graduate of Beijing University, <laughs> Chinese literature department. <laughs> and uh, so he didn't know how to do anything. Or how to <laughs> <laughs> so, so he hired these, and look, at it's going to have glass windows, it's, it has it has tiled roof, and it cost him one hundred dollars. Mm. So, when you realize that all the great masters in China have always been have had this hermit experience, <clears throat> and you see what happened to religion in China during the Cultural Revolution, and why there's a renaissance going on today in China, it's because these hermits were left alone largely. Because who wants to go up in the mountains and knock on a hut that somebody can build up? It was for 10 bucks or 20 bucks, or 100 if you want glass and tile. Uh, and incidentally, I, I met him three weeks ago. This, this photo was taken in 89. 
I met him uh, three weeks ago. He's the, the abbot of the most famous Zen monastery uh, for, for Soto Zen, the home monastery for all of Soto Zen, Dongshan. His name is, is, is Gu Dao. Uh, anyway. The reason these hermits are able to survive is because of this one device, the, the Kang, K-A-N-G, an oven bed. Uh, you have a hole at one end, and then you just have a brick, a brick uh, platform. And you have a flue where the, you build a fire in there, and the, the flue, and so it heats this, uh, the surface here, and you put a mat on top. So you sleep on your Kang. You meditate on your Kong, you eat on your Kong, you entertain guests on your Kong, everything happens on your Kong. So you don't have to heat air, you heat a surface. If you ever travel to monasteries in Korea, they, they do whole floors with calligraphy paper. Uh, and so you can sit on the floor, and there's, there's conduits under the floor, you can sit on, on, on heated floors in Korea. Um, this is a, a Buddhist nun. <coughs> She was almost in tears when I interviewed her in 89 because the village, she, it was her first year up there and the villagers weren't too sure about it. And you can see her roof is just straw and there's some plastic sheeting covering her windows. And I, I saw her two years later and she had a tiled roof and uh, some plastic, uh, really nice plastic in the windows and she was smiling because the villagers had realized she was worth supporting. So, Villagers all have a relationship to these people, and um, there are several reasons why the government doesn't screw with these people. One of them is because the villagers be really pissed off. Because when you have hermits on your mountain, it rains on time. <laughs> <laughs> or if you get sick, you have somebody to go see. Because these hermits have a, when you when you're a new hermit, you go up the mountain, you don't know anything except how to manage. But for 2,000 years, hermits have been living on that mountain, and they've been learning stuff. And so all the old hermits pass on this knowledge to the new hermits. So these hermits become doctors, the healers. Um, again, uh, the part of society. Uh, this is what, when I, in 89, this was the most famous uh, hermit in the mountains. Here. She was a Buddhist nun, had been in this hut 35 years and with the disciple. The last time I saw her alive, there were six Communist Party officials in her hut. They had, they had heard about her and wanted to know what, how they could help her. Hermits are a part of society. Everybody respects hermits. Um, that young girl there, um, she was a college student with, and went hiking with her friends one day, met this master, told her friends to go back down without her. She's been there ever since, and now she's the most famous teacher in the mountains. Um, she doesn't have her master smile. She's going to have to work on that. <laughs> but she's, she's really, really good. She's a very, very nice, nice teacher. Um, and you can see, here's a hermit tea party. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not an aesthetic lifestyle. It's just a simple lifestyle. They don't really have anything. So but what, they, what they have, they, 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 they share with you. They're so happy when they see somebody coming, unless they're a Tao spinning place. <laughs> and that, and that, that does happen. Um, here's a different kind of hut in South China, just to give you a different story. And uh, usually in the north, uh, most mountains, you cannot grow a staple. You can't grow rice or wheat. So you rely on, on money to buy that. But here, this hermit is growing his own rice. And he's even got flowers. <coughs> and he's an older hermit. He's doing something that also happens, but is, is less, less uh, common. He was the abbot of a famous monastery and then became a hermit. Um, usually it's the other way around. But <coughs> for all I know, he had been a hermit earlier in life. Anyway, this is, is a um, hermit. Um, my own association, again, was to go find these people because I had translated the poetry of Cold Mountain and um, Stonehouse. And so I thought I would show you, I, this, is my, this is my vehicle to go find Cold Mountain's cave, a little San Lucha, a three-wheeler, bad, <laughs> terrible roads, of course, but there's Cold Mountain's cave up, up there, up on that, that, that cliff face right up there, right there, that was Cold Mountain's cave, and, and here's uh, some of the poems he wrote there. 
You know, one of the very famous stories uh, about hermits was an emperor went into the mountains to find this hermit named Sio, near Loyal. And he met Sio. He said, I'd like to give you my throne. I'm tired of it, and, and I, I think you'd do a better job. And Sio was so disgusted by this, he went down to the stream and washed out his ears. <laughs> So that the words would not linger <laughs> in his ears. So here's a poem by Cold Mountain. Born 30 years ago, I have traveled countless miles along rivers where the green rushes sway to the frontier where the red dust swirled. I've made elixirs and tried to become immortal. I've read the classics and written odes. And now I've retired to Cold Mountain to lie in the stream and wash out my ears. <laughs> Here's another one by Cold Mountain. People ask the way to Cold Mountain, but roads don't reach Cold Mountain. In summer, the ice doesn't melt. Sunny days, the fog is too dense. So how did someone like me arrive? Our minds are not the same. If they were the same, you would be here. <laughs> and one, one more by Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain speaks these words as if he were a madman. He tells people what he thinks, thus he incurs their wrath. But a straightforward mind speaks straight words. A straightforward mind holds nothing back. Crossing the river of death, who's that jabbering fool? The road to the grave is dark, and karma holds the reins. And so that's, that's where Cole Mountain lived. And this other monk, Stonehouse, lived in this uh, hut, and it's been transformed. Often what happens uh, is a hermit becomes so famous, they attract disciples. And then they build huts next door. And so this is what happened here. He lived in the 13th century, relatively uh, recent. Here's a couple of poems about his hut, or his mountain. My hut is less than three mats wide, surrounded by mountains on every side. My bamboo cot couldn't hold a cloud. I shut the door before sunset. Trying to become a Buddha is easy, but ending delusions is hard. How many frosty moonlit nights have I sat and felt the cold before dawn? Not one care in mind all year. I find enough joy every day in my hut. And after a meal in a pot of strong tea, I sit on a rock by the pond and count fish. <laughs> Work with no mind, and all work stops. No more joy, no more sorrow. But don't think no mind means you're done. There's still the thought of no mind. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, uh, two, two years ago, I was, I was uh, writing a book about uh, Wei Ying Wu, a great Tang Dynasty poet visiting the places where, where he uh, used to live. And he wrote some poems about visiting this one mountain south of Xi'an. Xi'an. And, uh, called Sege, or, or Purple uh, Pavilion. And on my way up there, I, I met this, this, this Taoist woman. Um, of course, the Taoists usually wear white. Um, there's a, here's a poem called, and, and that peak there is where I'm headed. I'm heading for that peak. <coughs> and this is uh, by Wei Ying Wu, lived around 800 also, died before 800, in reply to Taoist master Dong Yu. And this is how Chinese usually read their poems. 这个西边的一级房，毛在夜雪湖水不爽。要看待是这个出一出山门，顺目中。So this Taoist master Dongling had written to Wei Wu, and he complained about the dangers and tigers being up on the mountain. So this is Wei Wu's poem. How many peaks are you west of Tsege in your thatched hut on a snowy night beside those tiger tracks? If I knew where you were in that distant blackness, I would follow your evening bell all the way up the mountain. Well, that's, that's my hermit show. But uh, <laughs> Din is going to... Uh, Ask some questions that, and, and possibly anticipate the questions you'd ask. That's wonderful. Thank you. So, so first, a round of applause. Beautiful photograph there. This is so lovely. She's a very famous doctor.
doctor. And so now people come from miles around to uh, actually different countries to, to study Chinese medicine. Well, so I'm going to ask you to use this. Just, just I want to make sure that we capture this on yeah. the video. So just, just if you don't mind. It's on. Is it? It's on. Yeah. Great. So I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the director of programming here, and it is such a delight to have you here, Bill. Um, thank Thanks. you so much for that amazing presentation. So. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about what's going on, what the sort of connection between all of this and kind of the rest of society in China. And you mentioned early in your book, Road to Heaven, the Confucian tradition that power must be based on virtue, uh, not connections, not kinship, and that hermits represented the earliest form of political criticism. Um, is that still true today? Well, in, in a sense it is, because uh, uh, when I did uh, <coughs> my when I wrote that book, Road to Heaven, which in, incidentally uh, it was published in, 19, in 1993, so it's been in print now for about maybe maybe 30, uh, 25 years, a long time, <laughs> and, and and it's it's never sold more than a thousand copies a, a year here in the states. In the states, but it, it came out in Chinese. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, and it sold nearly 400,000 copies. Um, and as I said earlier, we're in the same area where there were 200 hermits, now there are 600. And the kind of people who are hermits are very different. And that represents the, uh, the kind of people you're talking about, that, that just through their actions represent a critique of, of the current fluids in, in China. The, the kind of hermits I'm meeting uh, that I met in 89, high school educations were rare. Uh, but now, uh, college graduates are dying a dozen times. Um, because you're, you're getting people who have finally had a chance to pursue the goals that we think of are worth pursuing in our societies. And they're finding them uh, Whacking something, and so they're going off to the mountains to. Uh, and now they all have they have my book. And <laughs> when I did that documentary for that Chinese film studio about four or five years ago, all the hermits either had copies of my book or they'd heard about it. So uh, the Chinese have become a, a well aware of this ancient tradition that they have sort of forgotten. That there, there, there is an opportunity to go spend some time alone and uh, find something yourself. But I, I tell people that you, you can't just read a book and go practice in the mountains. It's like, it's like working on your PhD. You have to have an undergraduate program first. You have to have, have a practice, be it Buddhist, Taoist, or Confucian. And so once you establish that practice, then you can, then you can live in the mountains because it, 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 you get, you're so lonely. It's so cold. You get so hungry, and you get sick, and you, there's no stores, so it's really tough. And a lot of uh, times I'll be hiking in the mountains in China, and I'll see a, a new hut, and I'll be talking to a hermit, and I'll say, yeah, I, I saw a couple of new huts on the mountain, and they'll, they'll tell me, yeah, but they're not going to make it through the first winter. <laughs> and so, so, but there are these people now in China who are, 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 are toying with this, and uh, uh, as, as, as Re are recognizing it as a valid Chinese tradition and uh, engaging in it. And, uh, again, I don't think they do it intentionally to, to criticize anybody. It's more of a personal affirmation that I need to do something different. Mm -hmm. But it's a response, uh, it sounds like what you're saying is it's a response to consumerism, uh, you know, social pressures. I don't know, is it also a response at all? Is it any kind of statement? Um, in terms of a relationship to the government, or is it really more about just wanting to get away from meaningless consumer life? Yeah, the Chinese don't make statements about the government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can make a statement like this without making a statement. That, that's right, they're very good at that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah they do it in their paintings, they do it in their poems. Exactly. And hopefully yeah. nobody notices. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what is the um, government's relationship to the hermits? I mean, I know you said that you know, they've really not bothered them much. Although, I mean, during the Cultural Revolution, walk us through this a little bit. What happened during the Cultural Revolution to these hermits? 
There were, well, after interviewing them, there were very few hermits who were bothered. There, there, were, there was a six-month period when it got bad, and some hermits were, and only six months, when, when some hermits were forced down the mountain. But uh, many hermits didn't. There was a hermit I interviewed in Fujian, of course, uh, who spent, when he was 35, he had a vision. This mountain appeared to him in a dream. It was a local mountain and asked him to come to the mountain and protect it. And so he moved up to that mountain and he uh, lived in a cave. Um, you don't like spend the days in the cave, you know, you sleep in the cave. But anyway, he was living in this cave uh, at a mountain called uh, Tai Mushan and uh, southern uh, northern Fujian province. And while I was interviewing him, he kept asking me, who, who is this Chairman Mao you keep talking about? <laughs> he had lived on that mountain and never come down once in 50 years. So they, they, you can get people in China living like this and when, who were going through the Cultural Revolution who were completely unaffected or unaware of what was going on. Now that, of course, was not, not at all true of the big Buddhist monastery. Oh, so no. so um, what would you say? You spent a lot of time there as well and just recently came back from a trip to China where you were visiting a number of Zen monasteries in Jiangxi, right? Or, Jiangxi? Yes, yeah, no, all in Jiangxi. In Jiangxi. Um, so at this moment, with the rise of Buddhism and the monasteries, or at least the temples, are full of lots of worshippers, etc., how would you define the relationship of the government to that? Um, to the government. I mean, what is the, what, you know, what these the the um, you know abbots and the monasteries, etc. What what do they um, experience in terms of their relationship with the government and? Well, the, these religious traditions do pose a threat to the government because you, you get a government leadership that really has no ideology. There's no ideological reason why they should be in power. They just, it was like musical chairs. They were sitting down when the music stopped and they're in charge and they, you know, they run the country according to sort of an ad hoc series of decisions but not based on, a, on an ideology. So there's always been this, this uh, problem throughout Chinese history, um, not just now, but when, uh, the, when the, the government loses the mandate of heaven uh, and movements arise that overthrow the government. This has happened, uh, uh, you know, obviously every dynasty that ends ends with one of these movements and they're almost always Taoist inspired if not Taoist-led. And so you get government very, uh, shall we say, wary of movements like the Falun Gong, which is a typical dynasty-ending example, uh, example of the dynasty-ending movement that could topple the government. Uh, but of course, the Falun Gong is it's like a secret society. It doesn't really come to the surface. And when it does, it gets quashed. But, uh, so the monasteries, the government feels it has, has a better shot at, at main, remaining aware of what's going on. Um, but, but these monasteries are becoming more powerful simply because I tell people, <laughs> you know, because I like to do broad generalizations, <laughs> but I tell people the, the second thing a Chinese does when they become wealthy is they wire it ahead to the next life. I mean, first you take care of your family. Next thing you get the wire code to the next life. Where are you going to get the wire code? Monasteries, nunneries, Dawa shrines. They have the code. So all of these places are becoming incredibly wealthy, um, and a, which is a, actually a, a really terrible thing. The worst thing you can do to a spiritual center is give it money. You, you were saying earlier that you thought the biggest challenge for Buddhism actually is money. And yeah, I think that's true generally in the world with religion. Um, uh, money and religion don't really go together. Talk about that phenomenon, though, in the, the monasteries that you, you know, well, been visiting recently. Well, yeah, what, I, what do you mean by I, I, why I, is money a problem? Well, I just visited Doshan, the home of Soto Zen. Um, they just spent twenty million dollars building some new buildings, um, and that's that's just part of the monastery. The, the monastery. Um, you, you get, you and get, that money came from, from donors or? 
Uh, and well, wealthy people on the East Coast or from the government? Well, and, 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 Do, and Doshan, it came from one man, not Hai Jin, Master Nan. You know, not, not, not Hai Jin. Uh, very, very, very uh, smart man, but he's very, I met him in Taiwan back in the 70s when he was lecturing. Uh, he's a layman, a, a very famous Buddhist layman. In fact, when Shaolin Temple, Shaolin Temple, you know, in uh, modern times hasn't had a meditation hall. Uh, it was around 2005 when they opened up a meditation hall at Shaolin Temple. And they wanted to know how to, to do meditation in the hall. <laughs> so, what does that mean? What, they, you mean they had forgotten? Or? Yeah, they didn't know how to do it. I mean, and, and how to, it's a, it's a system, it's a, it's a dance, you know, there's a performance in a sense. So they sent their senior monks down to Shanghai to study with Nan Wai Jin uh, to, to learn how to run a meditation hall properly. So Master Nan had a, had a great following in China, made tons of money, and happened to invest in one of the major railroads in China from Wenzhou, uh, you know, to the coast, uh, to Shanghai. So he made a lot of money, and he, he donated that $20 million, and that was just the tip of his iceberg. He also established a major Confucian center on, on Lake Taibu. Uh, but anyway, so usually there'll be uh, one or two really wealthy families or individuals that will, uh, will do this. There's a, the man, the, the, the family that makes uh, guest jeans, a major jean manufacturer in the world, they give $5 million every year to Zen monasteries, and they pick a different one every year. So, uh, so that, okay, so, but that sounds like a wonderful thing, right? So why, is, why does that become a problem in these monasteries? Well, well because... Describe you're, you're, the sociology of that. Well, imagine, because these, these people are trained in meditation and living a celibate life, and uh, being vegetarian, celibacy, uh, simplicity, uh, and suddenly somebody hands you $5 million. There's no way to make good decisions when somebody gives you five million dollars. It would it really, if somebody gave any of us five million dollars, it would probably ruin our lives. Just like the Powerball winners, you know, their lives go to hell. And so these these temples give too much money, um, and it's not their fault. What are they going to do? These devotees are sincerely believe uh, in this tradition. And they want to show their respect, and they give all this money. Mm -hmm. It's just a shame that it's so much, but that's the way it is. And, and, and what's what's the impact of tourism? We talked about. Well, that. because because they give so much money, you build these palatial buildings, mm -hmm. and then it's beautiful, and then all these mm -hmm. people come not to practice there, not to meditate or, or take part in the ceremonies, but to just as as tourists, and uh, and the, the the people who live there don't really have, they're distracted all the time by trying to take care of two tourists. And so who wants to practice, who wants to leave home, become a monk or nun, and live in a place like that? <laughs> Although they're becoming very comfortable, you have, they have, you have hot water anytime you want it, the food's great. Um, <laughs> and it is, a vegetarian food is wonderful. Um, anyway, it, so it, how did um, you talked about how the abbot at Shaolin Monastery has dealt with the tourism, the explosion of tourism? And, and he's he's of course the most famous monastery in China, and so the richest monastery in China because so many tourists come there and they get a cut of the action. I think I think the government allows them to have twenty percent of the ticket price, um, and so they you know. Wow. I think their annual income is $60 million. I think, I think that Abbott told me that. That was maybe 10 years ago, they were averaging $60 million a year. So what do you do with $60 million if you're sitting in the Shaolin? Well, 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 one of the things, one of the good things he was doing with it, I don't know about the bad things, uh, and there's plenty of people who talk about the bad things, but one of the good things he does is, is he's been using the money to, to, uh, to to basically buy defunct monasteries and fix them up just a little. <laughs> and so what you, so if you're a monk uh, and come to live in his monasteries, he'll make you uh, take care of tourists for six months or a year, and then you can go spend a couple years at one of these countryside places. Uh, but still, that's still, that's too much money still, 60 million a year. So uh, obviously you have, you have a, a Investment portfolios that. 
Anyway. So, so let's open it up to, the, to uh, questions from the floor in a second. But I did want to just, going back to what you were saying about the, the hermits and uh, the sense that they're, you know, they want to get away from society and from the craziness of consumption and wealth and all this stuff. Tell, tell us what the monk, because you just spent a bunch of time, you're fr good friends with uh, many of these monks, um, and you were in the monasteries. What do they think about what's going on? What do they say about what's going on in Chinese society? They talk about that well, at all? Well, oh, yes, they, yes, of course they do, because they expect you to ask that question, and if you don't ask it, they'll answer it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so excuse so, me for asking the obvious question. Yeah, but no, they, they, they expect it because... Well, first of all, if, if any of them had a problem with it, they would have left. So all I mean, all I'm meeting are their survivors. They would have left. What do you mean, left like, China? No, left. no, they would have left that monastery. Okay. They would have said, "Oh, this is terrible. Right. I'm out of here." So I'm meeting the people who have right. remained right. in control of these monasteries, and so they have a standard explanation. They say, "Well, you know, uh, religion was suppressed in China for so many, so many years." People, people have lost not just a connection with it, but a knowledge of it. And so it's okay right now to, to have this phase that we're going through because this way we can educate the people who come here. Even though they're tourists, they're going to find something uh, out. And it's like we're planting seeds. And some seeds aren't going to sprout, but some will. Mm -hmm. And so th this is their standard explanation for how, how that they can force themselves to accept this. That's a fair point, don't you think? Of course yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, so let's, I see hands all over the place. From Shanghai. This gentleman was first, I think. He's from Shanghai. And then this oh, fellow from Shanghai. Yeah. This guy Je first. Jeffrey. Can you, can you introduce yourself first and then go ahead and ask the message? Jeffrey Bishop and Craig Bills. Um, actually went to Kodan's game Bill. And to that point, I, I'm curious today, as you go to these various hermit and cave locations, whether the tradition of poetry is still active and alive, whether you're whether the quality of that poetry uh, in this particular society, not the society, Chinese society, really resonates for you in the way that Cold Mountain and Stone House. Well, it, when I first went into the mountains, I never met anybody who wrote poetry in 89 or 90. But again, I'm, I'm meeting hermits who rarely have a high school education. But now I'm meeting hermits who have college degrees, and I am meeting people who are writing poetry in the mountains now. And they'll have the walls will have some calligraphy, whereas in the old days, a hermit might have a picture of the Buddha uh, on the wall. That'd be about it. Um, so, if I can follow up, is some of it published? Uh, no, 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 no. These it may be someday as they become better known. Um, and, you know, uh, China, Chinese have always written poetry, that, that, and they, they share, the first thing you do is you share your poems with your friends, and you share them. So the reason we have the poetry of Levi and Dufu is because they shared their poems with their friends. And so, who knows, these people's poems may end up getting collected someday. Please, go ahead. And I love your books, first of all. And so, Can you introduce curious. yourself? Yeah. Uh, you want, uh, from Shang. I'm um, very curious, have you ever tried to follow any of their practice? No. Except one of them taught me how to, how to move air through a wall. <laughs> and I learned that technique and it works. How is that done? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Except don't show this to anybody. But how do you know if the air has moved through the wall? Because my friend was on the other side. My, 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 the photographer friend. I, I wow. I said, wow, that can't be, that can't be. But it's this, it's a hand thing you do. Wow, okay. <laughs> yes, gentlemen, please. You, you mentioned the major religions <clears throat> as, as something that's practiced by the hermits. And notwithstanding the modern day college dropout or the person who wants to get away from society, are there hermits who are not religion based or do they need the religion to sustain them from these different well, if you, if, as long as we can, can include the Confucian tradition, then they're all, they're all on a path. They're not, they're not just there to write poetry. Um, well, I, but then again, those are sort of Confucian hermits too. But I, you are, there are 
wealthy people who are insinuating themselves into the mountains. And I say insinuating because they don't have the right to, to build, but they will find a way to maybe build something and pay off, maybe give some bribes. And, to, and uh, actually, one of my publishers in China has built a little hut, a very fancy hut in the Chungan Mountains. And they'll, they'll go off on weekends. A villa. That's called a villa. <laughs> exactly. So actually, so yes, so, so I take it back. So you do get people going into the mountains because mountains are beautiful places and they're, 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 we all like that solitude, even if we're not packed. But these people are not there for long periods of time. No, a weekend or so, and that's all they can handle. <laughs> I see a hand way in the back, please. Yes, uh, Introduce Andy Robbins, thank you for your, for your talk. Um, a more personal question to you is, uh, in your daily routines, uh, is there a part of the day when you actually shut off everything for meditation? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, when, uh, when I, after I get up and feed the cat, uh, if I don't feed the cat, I'm, you know, I can't meditate. Uh, <laughs> so usually I get up, pee, feed the cat, uh, wash my face, sit down for about 45 minutes, make some tea, and then the day begins. Actually, the day already began, but the other parts of the day. But yeah, every, every day, about 45 minutes. For how many hours, these, these hermits in the mountains, for how many hours will they tend to I would, meditate? Well, usually would... usually a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of hours at night. And during the winter, probably about eight hours a day. <coughs> wow. Because, because, you know, part of the day, you're, during the growing season, you're, you're tending plants. And because you have to live beyond the farmer commute, the territory you're living on is rather steep. So you have little patches. So you have to walk around in your 15-minute territory and tend your little patches. Um, and when th once things stop growing, then there's nothing to do. You stockpiled your wood, and you. Uh, well, there's four things you need as a hermit. You cannot uh, produce yourself. You need a staple: uh, uh, rice in the south, wheat flour in the north, and you need salt. Without salt, you're not making it through the winter. You have to salt vegetables, and then, of course, it's good to have some salt with your with your uh, cooking. And then uh, you have to have cooking oil. And you used to need kerosene for for lamps. Now they have solar panels. You know, little solar panels about the size of an iPad or so, and they can run usually two two bulbs off of, off of that, and and a phone charger. <laughs> Believe it or not, yeah, I, I'm eating hermits with cell phones. But, but usually what a hermit will do is, is their, her, their, their, cell, their cell phone will typically be on for one or two hours every week. And, and the people who gave them that phone and their disciples know which hours they can call. Uh, and, and then they, so they usually have one light in their hut and one light bulb out in the outhouse. And then, uh, and right off the side. So they don't need kerosene anymore. And I figured it takes about $10 to buy all that stuff that they can't produce themselves. So they need about 100 bucks a year from the outside. And they're going to get maybe 20% of that from the local villagers. And then they'll have a relative or a, an old friend or something who will supply about 20%. And they have to supply the rest with, their, with gathering wild herbs and selling them to herb collectors. Um, now, when my book came out in China, in Chinese, this same, uh, the guest jeans man in Hong Kong read it and uh, created a, a hermit foundation for the Sion area, for where I did my interviews. And so every hermit gets 100 bucks a year. Wow. That's um, great. So they don't have to do any, any of that hard work. I saw a hand over here. Yeah, hi, um, Shelly Baker. Thank you so much for having this talk. It's really fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about, you said your book, Road to Heaven, it is selling 400,000 copies in China? I was amazed when it hit 250, but now they said it's approaching 400 because there was, a, there was a TV program last year, last May, very similar to um, Sex in the City. <laughs> <laughs> and the male lead, 
in this program and told his girlfriend that she needs to learn more about Chinese culture and should read Bill Porter's Road to Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> scholar at Columbia, and I, for, I, I'm a teacher at Beijing. Yes, I study Buddhism and the modern religions in China. Y yes, I thank you for your presentation. You inspired me my good uh, memory in China. Uh, both of you mentioned that Buddhism is very rich in China today. I think uh, this is uh, fake news. It's fake news. Yeah, fake okay. news, yes. <laughs> uh, according to my survey uh, finished in 2015, uh, two years ago, yes, uh, in China we almost have 30,000 temples of Buddhism, and uh, only 1% of that is the tourist place. Mm -hmm. These tourist places in uh, downtown, in big city, or in famous mountains, they are very rich. But 90% uh, uh, temples are in rural, uh, rural and mountains somewhere. Uh, the monks and the nuns, the, the, uh, the, the, the incomes every month is about 80 Eighty dollars. Wow. Yeah, that is our uh, baseline on statistics. <coughs> when we published it, many monks and nuns called to me, uh, called to us. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> you, you tell the true situation. Interesting. Oh, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, Did you have a question, though? Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I, I think no question. Thank you for that information. Yeah, you mentioned many places. I never. Because I don't travel. Yeah, it's fascinating, though, the idea that there would be some rich pockets, but that the vast majority don't have the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. This gentleman. Yes. Yeah. Um, Bill, in your, in your travels and experiences, has there been any sort of universal essential element that you have found among the hermits that just continues to perpetuate the hermit movement? In other words, yeah. what does a hermit have that we may see their smile <laughs> I've never I've never in my life I've never met a group of people who have such great smiles they have absolutely nothing and yet they're the happiest people I've ever met and I'd say that is one element that you can find generally speaking among the hermits are they usually running from something or are they seeking something they're seeking mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's 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 a quest it's, it's rarely running right. from something Thank you. Yeah, sure. I think we have time for two more questions. Well, the man right next oh, yeah, exactly. I have a question about, um, like, Can you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, my name is uh, Ed Leon. I have just a question about, like, the Taoist um, practitioners. Because, like, I do, like, Nei Gong, you know, like, internal Kung Fu in, in Times Square at a, a Tai Chi studio. Like, are they, because the Tao, are they going to the mountains? Are they still trying to, like, perfect, like, immortality? Or what it yes. is? They, they still now? Oh, yeah. In 2018. Absolutely. And explain what that means for the rest of us. What are they oh. trying to do? Well, they're they're they're, they're practicing. In Taoism, you're 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 trying trying to transform this body that you you appear to have. Well, it turns out you have other bodies, and you can transform this body into into a a, a chi body, a body of energy, based on the the, the 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 system of chi. But you can also transform that chi body into a jing body. Uh, essential body and and the gene body into a spiritual body. So these are it's like the Russian doll, right? <laughs> uh, so these these transformations take a long time, long, long lots of practice, and so people are still doing this in China. The Taoists do not of the hermits I've interviewed, maybe twenty to twenty five percent are Taoists, uh, mostly mostly Buddhists, um, and of the hermits I've interviewed. At least, at least 50% are women. Uh, because it's easier for a daughter to convince her, their, her parents that she is following something that is okay. It's harder for a son to get the, the parents' permission. So you're seeing a lot of women in China as hermits, although generally speaking, women hermits live in pairs. And it's always master disciples. If you ever see men living in pairs, it's always same same age, brother disciples. 
Do we have one more question? I see this woman in the back there. Okay, and uh, I'm Lina, I'm librarians, and uh, uh, thank you for your introduce all of them. And that uh, mountain you mentioned, you are lecture, only the Zhongnan mountain I have not been. All others I've been. And, uh, but uh, I was, when I was old, that mountain, I was uh, hardly to see the doll. But I saw all of the, lot of the monk and the nuns. I only saw once in the Hua Shan, that mountain. But a couple of years ago, I read the newspaper. They introduced your book, so I bought one. So mm -hmm. I read it, so today I bring here. But I, my question is, is that when you uh, talk a community and visit them, is that the Tao people, they don't like uh, regular people or some of the bother them? They seem to all hiding in the, in the mountain and they do the things by themselves. They kind of big different than the other religion. Other religion, they want more people to come and you know, but it seems uh, only the people they really want to know them, you have to go to the mountain to see them. Yeah. Yeah. And they are not coming out to have some regular lecture or something, even the books. When I was in China, I was very weird to find that books. Well, so speaking, after that, we found the books. And I was in the library. I'm mean, the book order, the, the, the committee people. So I was uh, buying well, some of them. And even we have the Chinese uh, formats. <laughs> yeah, this is the English, but both we have the Chinese. This Thank is the published in the 19 something. Yeah, let's let him answer. Thanks. OK. <laughs> well, well this gen I, you know, I'm a generalizer. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, Taoists are introverts, uh -huh. and Buddhists are extroverts. OK. I mean, I know that's a simplification, but the Taoists are introverts. They're interested in a transformation of this body, what appears to be a body, into different kinds of bodies. Whereas the Buddhists are interested in the mind. So they tend to accept the entire universe as part of, of that mind. It's the outside world is just as valid as the inside world. So, um, But it's true that the Taoists are fewer in China. Taoists, again, and they do have this historical problem because they've led almost all the great uh, uh, dynasties that have been overthrown have been overthrown by Taoist movements, mm -hmm. Taoist-led or Taoist-inspired movements. So they have a, a historical problem uh, there. They're viewed with some suspicion, and, and thus you get certain kinds of movements that that are spin-offs from the Taoists, like the Falun Gong, that get get become you know. Uh, have serious problems with the government. Um, so the, the Taoists are, are into this personal cultivation, uh, whereas the Buddhists are into this communal <coughs> cultivation. So of course, that attracts different personalities. But, uh, but they're wonderful people when you...